There is nothing in the Bible more important than the revelation of fatherhood. It really is the central theme of the whole Bible. To discover this, let's turn to a beautiful prayer of the Apostle Paul, recorded in Ephesians 3, 14 and 15. This is only the beginning of his prayer, but that's what we need to look at. Ephesians 3, 14 and 15. For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Now there's something there in the original which isn't brought out totally in their translation. The word that's translated family there is patria, and it's directly derived from the Greek word for father, which is pater. We've got a lot of words in English derived from it. Patriot is one. Patristic would be another. And so what Paul is saying is, I bow my knees to the Father from whom every fatherhood in heaven on earth derives its name. That is actually Philip's translation. Let me say that once more. Paul says, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, or every fatherhood. You have to use both words, really. So what Paul is saying is, every family is a fatherhood. The head of every family, the source of the life of every family is a father. And every fatherhood is derived from the fatherhood of God. So the fatherhood behind all other fatherhoods and the reality behind all families is the fatherhood of God. It's the supreme reality of the universe. It makes all the difference on how we view things. What do we view as the source of the universe? Is it a big bang? Well, who knows what, might, what bang might come next? Is it just some inanimate force that relentlessly works out? Or is it a father? See, you'll be a totally different person when you once grasp the fact that the fact behind all life is the fatherhood of God. I have a friend who's a Catholic who's in ministry and he related some years ago that he was in a very bleak, windy, dirty street corner of a major American city. And believe me, they have a lot of dirty, windy street corners, bleak. And he felt so depressed and lonely. As a matter of fact, American cities are pretty dangerous places to be. And uh, dusk was falling. And he didn't really know how to handle the situation. But he just began to say, Father, Father, Father. And he probably repeated the word 20 times. And he said his whole attitude changed. He realized there was a Father behind everything else. You see, the realization of fatherhood will give you identity. It will give you security. It will give you motivation. We are surrounded today by billions of people on earth who lack those things, security, identity, and motivation. God's purpose is to provide those through the revelation of himself as Father. And the primary channel of that revelation is the family, which is the prime expression of fatherhood. See, I think many evangelical Christians really have never understood the destiny of our faith. We stop halfway. We never really make the journey to the end. Let me explain what I mean in John 14 verse 6, which is a kind of favorite text for evangelicals. Jesus said, I am the way, 
the truth and the life. Now many evangelicals stop there. I am the way, the truth, the life. It's a tremendous statement but it's incomplete. Because if Jesus is the way, where is he the way to? What's the destination if Jesus is the way? He's not the destination. What is the destination? The rest of the verse tells us, no one comes to the Father except by me. Jesus said, I am the way, but the destination is the Father. Now I have encountered thousands of evangelical and charismatic Christians and Christians of all sorts who are born again, who know Jesus as Savior and Lord. Their lives are committed to him, but they've never completed the journey. They've never really come to know the fatherhood of God. In John 17, that famous high priestly prayer of Jesus, he brings this out as the ultimate revelation of the gospel. It's the fatherhood of God. John 17 verse 1, he says, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that your Son also may glorify you. That title, Father, occurs six times in this prayer. It's the theme of the prayer. And then in verse 6, he says, I have manifested your name to the men whom you have given me out of the world. What name did Jesus manifest? Not the name Jehovah. The Jewish people had known that for 14 centuries. What was the name that was new, that's almost unknown in the Old Testament? Only about three places in the Old Testament. What is the name? Father, that's right. I have manifested you as Father to these people. And then the last verse of that amazing prayer says this, I have declared to them your name and will declare it. The revelation is not complete, but it's begun. That the love with which you love me may be in them and I in them. What will bring this love to fruition and fulfillment is the revelation of God as Father. I realize in my own Christian experience, for many years, I never really saw the destination. Partly because though I had a good father, one who really cared for me and provided for me, my relationship with him was distant. He was an officer in the British Army. During much of my boyhood, he was in India and I was in England. And so, in a way, I never really knew the intimate, warm relationship that a boy should have with his father. Consequently, I didn't realize what was waiting for me in God. I was wonderfully saved, I was serving the Lord, but I hadn't made the journey to the end because the destination is not Jesus, it's the Father. If you study the ministry of Jesus, everything he did was to attract attention to the Father. Every miracle he worked, every word he preached, he gave the Father the glory. And then if we go on to the last chapter of the New Testament, Revelation chapter 22, verses 3 and 4, we come to the end of the journey. This is the destination. We're not left still somewhere on the way. By the time the New Testament ends, the journey is complete. It says here, there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it and his servants shall serve him. <laughs> What's the ultimate reward for faithful service? Continued service, that's right. There's nothing better than serving the Lord. So his servants who have served him in this life shall serve him forever. And then it says, they shall see his face. And remember, that's the most tremendous climax because Paul said of the Father, whom no one has seen nor can see, who dwells in light unapproachable. It's going to take all the processes of salvation to bring us to the place where we can see the Father's face. And then it says this, His name shall be on their foreheads. What name? Father. Now when you have a name on your forehead in the Bible, it means you have apprehended the truth in that name. 
at last we have really will have understood what it is to have God as our Father. There's an interesting passage in Revelation <coughs> in chapter 14 which speaks about the 144,000 about whom so many people have so many different theories. Personally, I simply believe they're just the people that are described exactly. 12,000 from every one of 12 tribes. But as my friend Bob Mumford says, how can I help it if I'm right? <laughs> see, if I, if I attribute it to him, I sound humble. You see. <laughs> All right, let's move on. Revelation 40, 14, verse 1. Then I looked and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000 having his father's name written on their foreheads. Now some texts will say having his name and his father's name. But you see, and if you look at the last verse of that section, verse 5, in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. That's a marvelous recommendation. What's distinctive about them? They have the Father's name in their foreheads. They've apprehended what it is to have God as Father. So you see the tremendous sacred privilege of every human father is to represent to his family the fatherhood of God. The supreme revelation of the whole Bible. God doesn't just write things on pages. God puts truth in persons. We have the Bible, thank God, for the written scripture, but Jesus said, I am the truth. And I think many of us would acknowledge that if it was mere abstract truth, it would never satisfy us. What satisfies us is the truth in a person. See, I was a professional philosopher. I was tremendously wrapped up in all sorts of exciting theories about life and its purpose and the ideal state. I was a student of Plato, a devoted student of Plato. I read every word Plato ever wrote in the original language. But my problem was I couldn't live in that rarefied atmosphere all the time. So about half the week I'd be up there with the theory of ideas and the other half of the week I'd be right down there living it in a very <laughs> carnal way. And I never was satisfied, because just abstract truth doesn't satisfy us. When I met Jesus, I knew I had met the truth in a person, and that satisfied me as no abstract truth could ever do. And in a certain sense, God has committed to every father the responsibility to represent as a person the ultimate revelation of the Bible, fatherhood. I would say the most godly thing that any man can ever be is a father. The most godlike thing, because that's the ultimate revelation of God himself. Now every father does represent God to his family. That's not an option. The question is, does he represent him rightly or wrongly? And I suppose the greatest curse of our present age is fathers who've misrepresented God. I remember the record of a man who was witnessing on the street to young men and women. And he said to a young man he was talking to, God wants to be your father. And the young man answered, my father is the man I hate most in life. See? Instead of being a recommendation, it was a barrier. Most sociologists and psychologists and other people in that sort of profession would agree that a child forms its first impression of God from its father. Is the father loving, accessible, compassionate, strong? It's easy for the child to pick, picture God that way. But if the father is bitter, angry, critical, or just absentee and irresponsible, that child begins life with a very negative idea about God. And often it takes a great deal to break down that negative approach to God. <clears throat> Let's go a little step further now in this picture of what it is to be a father. 
I think I need to say at this point that I'm not providing merely theory. I have experience. When I married my first wife, I inherited eight adopted daughters on the same day. So, I mean, I started ahead of most people. <laughs> of those daughters, six were Jewish, one was a Palestinian Arab, and one was English, and later we adopted a black African baby. So we have a pretty good cross-section of the human race in our family. And it's very interesting, because the older they grow, the more characteristic they are of their original race. It's very interesting. I can't go into that. But uh, what I'm saying is, I'm just not offering you theory. I'm far from saying I've always been a successful father. I wish I could say it. But I've tried to learn from my mistakes, which have been many, and I would try to help some of you to avoid making some of the mistakes that I've made. See, why should everybody go ahead and make all the same mistakes all over again? So, uh, as I say, I'm not talking from theory. Let's look now in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 3. 1 Corinthians 11, 3. I want you to know the head of every man is Christ. The head of woman or wife is man or husband. The head of Christ is God. If you put that from the top downwards, you have a descending chain of authority that starts with God the Father and ends up in the home. You see, that's why you can't play around with the Bible's teaching about family life, because it's based on the eternal nature of God himself. God is a father. He's the head of Christ. Christ is the head of the husband, the husband is the head of the wife. Now in that chain you find two persons who relate both upwards and downwards. Christ relates upwards to the father, downward to the man. The man relates upward to Christ and downward to the wife and by implication his family. So in the same way that Christ represents God to the man, the man is responsible to represent Christ to his family. Can you see that? If you want a definition of the responsibility of a husband and a father, it's to represent a Christian husband and father. It's to represent Christ to his family. If, if you're looking for a job description, that's it. Now, there are three main ministries of Christ, as I understand it, in which the Father should represent him to his family. Christ is priest, prophet, and king. And the husband has responsibilities in all three areas. He's responsible to be the priest of his family, the prophet of his family, and the king of his family. Let's look at each of those in turn. First of all, the father as priest. The priest is the one who does, what's the distinctive word, the unique word for connected with the priest? One word, sacrifice. That's, the father is obligated to offer a sacrifice on behalf of his family. In the New Testament, the primary sacrifice is intercession, which incidentally, as we've been hearing, means praise, Thanksgiving. You know that you help people tremendously in the spirit when you just praise God for them. There's a story, I didn't want to go into it, but it comes to me, of a man named Praying Hyde. Some of you have heard of him. He was a tremendous missionary in the Punjab in India, when India was still under the British. And he was really, his ministry was prayer. Everything else was secondary. And God taught him some tremendous lessons in prayer. And quite early on, he came across an Indian evangelist whom he considered to be ineffective and cold. So he wanted to pray about this man, and he began, Lord, you know how, and he was going to say, cold, brother so-and-so is. But the Holy Spirit stopped him and said, don't you accuse God's servant to him. You see, how shall we accuse those whom God has justified? So he changed, and he began to think of everything good in that man's life, and to thank God for it. 
And within a few months, that man was a flaming, successful evangelist. What changed him? Not being accused, but being the object of thanksgiving. And I would say to, to husbands and fathers, take a lot more time thanking God for your family. Because you create an atmosphere around them that makes it easy for them to succeed. Our God has taught me this. If I cannot thank God for somebody, I have no right to pray for them. I'd better not pray at all. Because my prayer will do them more harm than good. So that's just by the way. But as I sometimes say, there's no extra charge for that. Let's look at a picture now of a man in the Old Testament, Job, who was a model as a priest of his family. We look at the opening chapter of Job. Verses 1 through 5. There was a man in the, in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright and one who feared God and, and, his, and shunned evil. And seven sons and three daughters were born to him. Also his possessions were 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and a very large household. This man was the greatest of all the people of the East. Now his sons would go and feast in their houses, each on his appointed day, and would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. So once every week, as I understand it, all God's children got together to feast. Seven sons and three daughters. Now Job knew their practice and this is what he did. So it was when the days of feasting had run their course that Job would send and sanctify them. And he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did regularly. Now that's the Old Testament pattern of intercessions. Offering sacrifice for every member of your, every one of your children. And when you offer the sacrifice for them, you claim on their behalf the benefits of the sacrifice. It says Job sent and sanctified them. I really don't know exactly what it means, but I think it means that in some way Job let them know that he had claimed the benefits of the sacrifice on their behalf. That's the picture of intercession. Claiming the benefits of a sacrifice on behalf of those for whom you are praying. Of course, the sacrifice for us is the sacrifice of Jesus. So intercession for our children is really, in a way, claiming the benefits of what Christ accomplished on the cross by his death on behalf of our children. Now you might say, if you were a little bit cynical, well, it didn't do much good. Because in one disaster, all his children were wiped out. Now here's one of the cases where you need to read the Bible carefully. I'd like you to turn with me to the closing chapter of Job. And James says, consider the patience of Job and the end of the Lord. In other words, don't form any conclusions till you've read the end of the story. And you remember after Job had learned his rather hard lessons, he was fully restored. Incidentally, when did restoration come to him? It's just a matter of interest when he prayed for his critics. <laughs> so don't let your critics get you down. Use them as a ladder to climb up on. See, pray for them. And God will release his grace to you. Now it says in verse 12 of chapter 42, Now the Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning. For he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, and 1,000 female donkeys. He had exactly double the number of livestock. But the next verse says he had also seven sons and three daughters. He only got the same number of sons and daughters as he had before. Why? Why didn't God double them? My understanding is because Job's prayers had been answered. And though they'd been carried out of time into eternity, they were in God's keeping in the place of the righteous dead waiting the redemption that comes through Jesus Christ. So it did pay, you see? And in fact it shows how urgent it is to pray for your family. Job had no idea that a disaster was coming in which the whole family would be carried off in one moment. But his prayer prevailed. 
Let's never look just at the results in time. That's a great mistake of contemporary Christians. The ultimate results are in eternity. Well then let's look at the ordinance of the Passover, which is a tremendous example of the Father's ministry as priest. It's, it's recorded in, Genesis, in Exodus chapter 12. And you recall that it was through the sacrifice of the Passover lamb that Israel were delivered out of their slavery in Egypt and brought out to be a new nation. Whereas the Egyptians who had no sacrifice endured the judgment of God upon their firstborn. Now the ordinance of the Passover depended on the Father. There was no one else who could do what the Father had to do. And so Moses said in Exodus 12 verse 3, Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth day of this month, every man shall take for himself a lamb, according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. So every father had a responsibility to provide a sacrifice for his household. And then the way that the sacrifice uh, was made effective was by sprinkling its blood on the outside of the door, the lintel, the two doorposts. And this is recorded in Exodus 12, 22 and 23. And you, that's every father, shall take a bunch of hyssop, dip it in the blood that is in the basin, and strike the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin. And none of you shall go out of their house, out of his house, until morning. For the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and not allow the destroyer to come into your houses to strike you. So the only protection in Egypt was the blood of the Passover lamb sprinkled visibly on the outside of the door of every home. And there was only one person who could sprinkle the blood. Who was that? The father. See, the well-being of his whole household depended on the father's faithfulness as a priest. Do you think God's principles have changed? I don't. I think it's the same today. And then, turning on to the New Testament, we have that amazing incident of the epileptic boy in Mark chapter 9, whom the disciples could not heal. But when Jesus came down from the Mount of Transfiguration, the Father brought the boy to Jesus. And we'll just read the brief conversation. The Father described all the sufferings of the boy, etc. And Jesus said to him, If you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. What impresses me about that is the boy could not believe for himself, but the, but the Lord help, held the father accountable to believe for his son. I believe that's a principle. I believe that God holds fathers accountable to have faith for their children. See, the boy was hopeless. He couldn't do anything for himself. He was an epileptic. Jesus said, if you can believe, it will be done. I wonder how many of us as fathers recognize our responsibility to exercise faith for our families. I noticed one thing about the ministry of Jesus, which became very real to me when God plunged me into the ministry of deliverance because I often had people that would come up in a meeting with a child and say, pray for him or pray for her. I learned to ask a question. Are you the parents of the child? Quite often the answer would be, no, we're not the parents. The parents are not believers, but we want to bring this child. I challenge you to search the ministry of Jesus. He never prayed for a child except on the basis of the faith of one or both parents. There is no scriptural precedent for that. See. Jesus never went against the Father's divine order. Parents have much greater responsibility than most of us are willing to acknowledge. 
They say in German, I won't say it in German, but they say, to become a father is easy, to be one is difficult. <laughs> Would you agree with that? And then we look on in the ministry of Paul, the famous incident in Philippi where the jail was shaken with an earthquake and all the prisoners were set free. The jailer was about to kill himself because he was answerable for his life, with the, for the lives of the prisoners. If they escaped, his life had to answer for it. But do you remember Paul said, don't kill yourself, we're all here. And so he cried out that age-old question, what must I do to be saved? And here's the New Testament answer, verse 31 of Acts 16. So they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Now a lot of evangelicals stop there, but that's not the end of the verse. You will be saved, you and your household, your family. What a pity to cut off those last few words because a father has the privilege to believe for the salvation of his family. Because of the responsibilities that he has, God also gives him the authority. See, God never gives responsibility without authority. Nor does he give authority without responsibility. So because of the tremendous responsibilities that God has placed upon a father, he gives him the authority to believe for his household. That's what Joshua said. He said, as for me and my house, what did he say? We will serve the Lord. How did he know his house will serve the Lord? Because he had the authority to believe for them. Now I was dealing with a dear lady once who came to me all troubled about her unsaved family. And I said in a comforting way, well Acts 16, 31, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved in your family. And she went away and the Holy Spirit very gently chided me. And he said, you misapplied that scripture. It was not spoken to a woman. It was spoken to a man who was the head of his house. He had the right to believe for his house. Now, you ladies will be up in arms maybe and say, well, what about us? Don't go to that scripture because it's not a basis. You want a real good pattern? If you'll humble yourself, it's Rahab the harlot. <laughs> she, oh, how marvelous. She believed for her whole household. But it was not on the basis of her position in the family, you understand? It was on the basis of faith which God gave her. So there we are. That's the father's responsibility as priest. Let's look at the father's responsibility as prophet. You can put it this way. As priest, he represents his family to God. As prophet, he represents God to his family. And that again is the special, unique privilege of every father. Uh, let's look in Ephesians 6 verse 4. Paul says, And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. Whose responsibility is it? to teach the children the truths of God's Word. I didn't hear that was a very timid answer. Who usually does it? Mother. Is that God's order? No. See. And you know what happens if that's the way it's done? Little Johnny grows up and when he's about 12 years old, he says, I want to be a man like my father. He doesn't go to church. He doesn't read the Bible. So I don't have to. Understand? The problem about the woman doing it, and God bless the women who do it, but the problem is that the boys get the impression that Christianity is something for women. And if you're going to be a real man, you'll go a different route. See? Colossians 3.21, Paul says something that goes together with that other passage. Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. See, there's a there's a middle line. On the one hand, exercise discipline. Don't let them become undisciplined. For some years I was principal of a college for training teachers in East Africa. And one of the things that became very clear to me is if you cannot discipline children, you cannot teach them. 
That's why there are so many untaught children in contemporary culture, because there's no discipline. Without discipline, it is impossible to teach. Tell you, I would not for a million dollars a year be a teacher in our present culture. It's an impossible task. So if you're going to teach, you have to maintain discipline. But at the same time, Paul says, don't provoke them. Don't discourage them. Don't be harsh and critical. Don't cause them to give up. If you're continually pointing out to your child that he's wrong, you come to the point where you think, there's no good, I might as well not try, I can't do right anyhow. So there's this middle ground, but the responsibility is that of the father. And then in Deuteronomy 11, Moses gives some amazingly wise advice on how fathers should fulfill this responsibility for the spiritual instruction of their family. Deuteronomy, the 11th chapter, beginning at verse 18. And the essence of the responsibility is to bring God's Word to your family. Deuteronomy 11, 18. Therefore you shall lay up these words, and these are addressed to fathers, these words. Therefore you shall lay up these words of mine in your heart and in your soul, and bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. In other words, what's to be conspicuous in your life? The Word of God. You shall teach them to your children, speaking of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. In other words, every situation in a family's life is an occasion for teaching Scripture's truth. Don't confine it to a religious setting on one day in the week. I have ministered to the children of quite a number of ministers over the years, and some of them are the worst rebels. And what I discovered about them was that for most of them, their religion they viewed as a special suit that they put on to go to church on Sundays, wore in church, came back home, took it off and put it in the closet and didn't wear it again till next Sunday. See, that was partly their parents' fault. Because if religion is worth anything, it's got to be part of the daily life of the home. My first wife before I married her was mother to these girls for about 18 years on her own. Very short of money, often without any promise of food for the next day. But one thing she did was to get the children praying with her. She said, children, we've got nothing for breakfast, you better pray. They prayed, food came, and that taught the children more about God than a dozen lessons in Sunday school, you understand? They saw God answers my prayers. Don't ever keep children out of your spiritual life. Bring them into it. If you're going on holiday, we all pray together about the holiday, where you'll go, what you'll do. If one of the children has a problem at school, don't just correct them, say, let's pray together about it. Because if children learn to pray, they'll grow up believers. I can say that out of experience. I think of none, none of our girls have ever been without temptation, believe me. They've all had their trials and their problems. But basically, if you talk to them, they'll always remember something in their lives when God dramatically intervened. I remember one of the girls, who's not really part of our family, but she closed a big iron door on her toe and almost cut the toe off. And Lydia called her and prayed and the toe was healed. Well, that girl was not by any means a model Christian, but she never escaped from the fact that she knew she had a toe because her mother prayed. See. My youngest, my English daughter, was about 18. She was with us in Kenya when we were serving there. And we went to a conference in Mombasa and met there a dear brother who's with the Lord now and Elizabeth, that's her name, was very short-sighted and her eyesight was deteriorating. And every year we had to get her thicker glasses. We said, Brother Matson, would you pray for Elizabeth's eyes? He prayed. She took her glasses off. We didn't tell her to do that. 
So a few days later, we, we wondered how she was doing. How are your eyes? We said. Well, she said he prayed, didn't he? She had 20-20 vision. She later became a nurse and never had to wear glasses, you see. Well, she went through her tests. But one thing she knew, God is real. He answers prayer. See, that's a kind of anchor when people are carried away in the tide of this world. Let them remember something that happened in the home. When you prayed with them and God answered. See, don't keep children out of your spiritual life. Bring them into it. I have a, a friend who's a close friend of mine, minister. He has four daughters. And they're like, uh, or they were like, um, Philip's daughters. They were all virgins and they prophesied. One of them is married now, but they all prophesied. And each of them had a special prayer ministry. One would pray for finance, another would pray for healing, and another would pray for another aspect, you see? But that family has stuck together and those girls are rooted in Christ because they shared in the spiritual life of the home. You don't bless children by taking all the responsibility from them. On the contrary, the more you commit to them, the stronger they'll grow. You've got to do it with wisdom. Finally, just one other picture of the father as, as prophet, the one who represents God to his family. I have taught so many times on that scripture as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. And I've pointed out all the awful evils of the day of Noah, which is all true and it's happening in front of our eyes. But one day I found out something else. There's a good side to that. Hebrews 11 verse 7. By faith Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. So there's another aspect of Noah's day. Noah, the righteous man, heard from God about the disaster that was coming, made preparation and saved his family. Now I really believe that we're living in days when we're going to have to be like that. Because I think more and more sudden disasters are going to sweep the earth. And it's, it's no longer safe to travel by air. You never know when there'll be a bomb on the plane. But if you have the inside of Noah, you'll know how to save your family, how to protect your family. Incidentally, this is just a little light relief for a moment, but I heard about a man who was very nervous about traveling because he was afraid that there would be somebody on the plane with a bomb. So a statistician told him, well, the chances of one man on the plane with a bomb is one in 450,000. But the chances of two men on the same plane with a bomb is one in five million. So after that, he always carried a bomb. You see? <laughs> That's not recommended for the example of Noah. All right, we're going on now to the father as king or governor. First Timothy 3, 4 and 5. Speaking about an elder, one who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? The word there is rule or govern. That's the third aspect of the ministry of Christ. He represents, uh, of the ministry of the husband. He represents Christ as priest, as prophet, as king. What's the job of a king? To rule or to reign. That's right. Now, this has kind of dropped out of a lot of thinking today. And we live in an atmosphere where Authority is almost a dirty word. But the fact of the matter is, without authority, all you have is anarchy. So we need authority. And above all, we need the authority of the Father in his home. What's always impressed me is God's statement about why he chose Abraham. Let's turn to Genesis 18 for a moment. 
And we'll read verses 17 through 19. But let me point out about the very name of Abraham. You know his original name was Abraham, which in Hebrew is Avram, which means exalted father. Then when God made his second and eternal covenant with him, he changed his name to Avraham, which means father of a multitude. But the essence of Abraham's character was that he was a father. It was as a father that God chose him because he wanted a new nation to come from him. And the Lord here in Genesis 18 reveals why he chose Abraham. There were hundreds of thousands of men on earth at that day and amongst all of them God picked out one man to be the privileged, unique head of a new race. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am doing? Since Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I have known him in order that he may command his children and his household after him, that they may keep the way of the Lord to do, just, to do righteousness and justice, that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken to him. Why did he choose him? What did he see in him that made him eligible? There's two ways of translating that. I prefer the old translation which says, I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him, that they will keep the way of the Lord. This other translation says, I have known him, I've chosen him in order that he may command his children and his household. But whichever translation you use, the fact of the matter is, the feature of Abraham's character that made him eligible for God's choice, one of the most privileged positions in history, was that God could rely on him to command his children and his household. There is a time for the father to command. There are situations in which orders have to be given and rules have to be observed. And I'll tell you one thing, if you want to produce an unhappy child, withhold discipline from it. The most unhappy children are the ones who have no discipline in their life. And they're the most insecure. Because a child likes to have boundaries that give him a security. I remember my African daughter once, when she was about 16, was going through some of the problems that teenagers go through. Although she's a very sweet Christian girl. She wanted to do something that was really not wise or right. And she looked at me and said, Can I do it? Will you let me? And I said, No, I won't, because it'll be bad for you. You would have thought she would have been upset, but I saw in her face she was relieved that I'd set a boundary, understand? She didn't have the strength in herself to make her own boundary, but she was grateful to me for setting a boundary. It is unfair to turn children loose, especially in the world as it is today, and make no boundaries for them. The boundaries should be simple and practical, and you should be able to explain them to children. Why don't we watch such and such a program on television? Well, because it's very undermining to your spiritual and moral life. And of course, that's one of the major problems we have today. I think probably in most households today, one of the greatest responsibilities of the father is to check the use of television. Because for me it's simple. I never turn it on, but that's not everybody's solution. And I'm not recommending that. I'm not saying that makes me more spiritual than anybody else. I just dislike television. To me it's an interruption on the things that really matter. If I want to find out what's happening in the world, I buy a weekly news magazine. Then I don't waste my time listening to commercials and getting a whole lot of information which is absolutely unimportant the next day. But I know that I'm an exception. That's all right. I'm not worried. Don't be upset about me. But notice the other thing. 
that the Lord said about Abraham in that passage. Since Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation. I want to tell you for sure that a nation is no greater than its fathers. If the fathers fail, a nation is sure to decline. The strength of every nation is in the character and integrity and strength of its fathers. In Romans 4 verses 11 to 12, we don't need to turn there, we are told that Abraham is a father to all those who walk in his steps. In other words, it's not enough just to say, I'm born again and therefore Abraham is my father. We have to walk the way he walked. And in no area is it more important than in the family. And then we need perhaps for a moment just to consider one other man who was very close to Abraham and his name was Lot. If you study the career of these two men, they went through a lot together. Every revelation that Abraham had, did I say something wrong? No, oh, a lot, mm. sorry. Okay, thank you. They went through a great deal together. <laughs> I, I agree, it should be better said. And then they came to the place where they were going to separate. And you know what a perfect gentleman Abraham was? He didn't say, I'm going to choose this. He said, Lot, you choose. Whatever you don't choose, I'll take. And he was the senior man, the man with the real knowledge of God. And he didn't grab. You know that? Somebody said, God gives his best to those who leave the choice to him. Are you willing to do that? Abraham said, God, I know you have a rule. So Lot headed for where? Sodom. What attracted him? Basically, money, prosperity. Lot was a lover of the world and the things of the world. We read the end of that chapter, he was headed for Sodom. Next time we read about him, he was right inside Sodom and a kind of respected citizen. And then came the time when God was going to pronounce and bring judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah. And because of Abraham's intercession, God sent two angels to get Lot out of Sodom. And they said, if you've got anybody here, sons or daughters or sons-in-law, warn them because God is going to destroy this city. And Lot went to talk to his sons-in-law said, God is going to send judgment. They laughed at him. They couldn't take him seriously. And so eventually he escaped with his wife and two daughters and his wife didn't make it because she was turned to a pillar of salt. And he left the rest of his family in Sodom. What I want to point out to you is this. Lot led his family into Sodom, but he couldn't get them out again. What a responsibility. Fathers, where are you leading your family? What is it that motivates you? Do you love the world and the things of the world? You're in danger of going the way of Lot. Now one brief thought as we close. How can you fulfill your responsibility as a father? This is something I have thought about much myself. It's not just a theory that I'm handing out. I want to suggest to you maybe five things to keep in mind. Number one, acknowledge your responsibility. Take your position. Say, God, I'm a father. I understand at least in a measure what you expect of a father and I accept my responsibility before you. You see, in the Bible, as I've said, responsibility and authority go together. God gives authority to those who accept responsibility. If you don't accept responsibility, you won't have authority. Because that's the justice and the wisdom of God. If you will accept your responsibility, you don't have to be a tremendous success. You don't have to have all the answers, but you have to be willing to say, God, I accept my responsibility then God will give you the authority that you need 
because authority comes from God. He's the only source. Second, humble yourself before God. Acknowledge, God, this job is too big for me. I really can't handle it. Peter said, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. You want his grace? Humble yourself. That's not difficult because the job of a father is so exalted that none of us is capable of fulfilling it in our own strength. Thirdly, trust God for the grace. Expect him to give you the grace. Exercise faith. Like if you were called to the ministry of, let's say, an evangelist, you would trust God for the grace to be an evangelist. Well, why can't you trust God for the grace to be a father? You see what I'm saying? Which is really a much more difficult ministry. My personal opinion, the two hardest jobs in the world are number one being a father and number two being a pastor. And God have mercy on the man who's both a father and a pastor. I respect them. Fourth principle is very simple, be diligent. Give it all you've got. It's not a part-time job. It's not something you do with your left hand. It demands all you have to do it right. And finally, make it the first claim on your time. You see, the amount of time you give to a thing indicates the priority you give to it. Most delinquent children, when they talk to counselors or youth workers, all have one complaint. Our parents never listened to us. They would lecture us, they would tell us what to do, but they never let us talk to them. You see, when Moses said, to be a father, you've got to teach your child when you walk by the way, when you sit down, when you rise up, he meant it's a full-time job. So it takes all you've got. Doesn't mean you don't have a secular job, but it means that really being a father is your number one priority. You give it first place in your life. Let me just recapitulate my recommendation. And I want to say, frankly, I know in many areas I haven't succeeded in doing this all the time. If I were to go through my time as a father again, there's one thing I would do. I would spend more time with my children. Like many ministers, I was personally ambitious. I wanted a successful church. And many times I think I sacrificed my family to the church. I would never do that again. I'm sorry. Let me give you my five recommendations and we close. Acknowledge your responsibility and with responsibility goes authority. Second, humble yourself before God. Third, trust God for the grace. Fourth, be diligent. It's a full-time job. And fifth, make it the first claim on your time. Those of you that are fathers and husbands, I'd like to pray for you. Would you like to stand? Wives, you just join me in praying for your husbands and the fathers of your family. Father, I want to thank you so much that your name is Father, that you are a Father, that you really care about families, that the family is the way you want to make yourself known on earth. And I thank you for every dear brother in Christ who's standing before you now. And Lord, I include myself amongst them. And I pray, Lord, for the release of your grace in these men and in their families in a new measure from this night forward. Lord, I believe I have faith right now in the name of Jesus to release the grace upon them that they will need for your glory, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.